I'm Jeff Shepard, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Nixon Foundation uh, to another in our series of Nixon Legacy Forums. I believe this is our 13th forum over the course of the past two years. We co-sponsor these with the National Archives, and in a nice way, they have the documents, we have the heads, we have the people who wrote the documents, and it's a way of bringing texture and context for future scholars and researchers to better understand the whys and the wherefores that went in to the creation of these documents. And we're terribly pleased to be doing this with National Archives, and we think they're pleased to be doing it with us. Our host today is the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and it's most appropriate that we be here, not only because they've supplied the facility, uh, but because, as, as you will soon learn, uh, uh, several of the participants are closely associated with CSIS. And while energy crisis may mean to some people just the price of gas at the pump, it has international defense, foreign affairs uh, implications every bit as much as domestic. Uh, my job is to introduce the moderator, but before I do that, we have come across a really fun little segment of President Nixon himself uh, speaking on September 26, 1971 at the Hanford Breeder Reactor in uh, the state of Washington. And he's introducing people, and it's, it's uh, during the campaign, and he's relaxed and at ease, and it's an interesting uh, shot. So if we can run that segment, we'll show you President Nixon introducing his energy team. We have also the biggest man in the President's cabinet, the Secretary of Interior, Rogers Martin. See, you see what I mean? My football coach, Chief Newman, used to say he's big enough to go hunt bear with a switch. <laughs> and uh, we also have the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, the new chairman who succeeded Dr. Seberg, Dr. James Schlesinger. And then two of the top members of the President's staff. Uh, these are people you've read about and heard about. Uh, first, uh, Mr. John Ehrlichman, who comes from the state of Washington, Seattle, and who heads up the Domestic Council. John Ehrlichman. <laughs> Incidentally, you think that Governor Evans is a lobbyist for Hanford in the Tri-City area. You ought to hear Ehrlichman. He is all out. <laughs> And then another man that I'm sure you've heard about who's enormously interested in the, this matter. I understand, incidentally, uh, Dan Evans told me that it was once said that more PhDs live in this area than any area of the United States. That was at least the case a few years ago, and probably there's still as many per square uh, acre or a mile as the case may be. Well, we have a very famous PhD on our staff, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, our advisor for international affairs. So there you have it, a little film clip from out of the past. And uh, as, as, as you know, uh, Dr. Schlesinger is here with us uh, this morning, uh, young and, and spry. And, uh, uh, you know, time has stood still for all of us. Uh, it was only uh, uh, four decades ago. Our, our moderator today is Guy Caruso, and I'm going to turn it over to him. Uh, he's had 30 years of experience in wrestling with uh, energy issues. Uh, he was actually the Middle East oil analyst at the Office of Economic Research at the CIA uh, during the Nixon administration. So if you're into conspiracy theories, uh, uh, you can start with, uh, with Guy. Uh, uh, he's currently senior advisor here for energy and national security programs at uh, CSIS. And in between, uh, he spent a lot of time at the uh, Departments of Energy and the International Energy Agency uh, uh, in, in Paris, France. So we have an excellent moderator who, in turn, will introduce the other speakers. Guy? And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see so many uh, longtime friends and to be part of this uh, 
panel for that. My job today is to set the scene and then let the policymakers uh, up during the Nixon administration, who we have uh, with us today, really give us their reflections. But to just to remind everyone, when President Nixon came into office in uh, January 1969, the backdrop was one in which the country still was in considerable turmoil, rioting uh, from 1968 demonstrations still raging over Vietnam. Uh, the economists were wrestling with the low growth scenario with high inflation, so-called stagflation. Uh, there were concerns about the uh, trade and currency reform. And the Democrats, although they had lost the presidential election, a very close election, had captured both the House and the Senate, which of course come to play as we talk about Nixon attempts to get legislation passed on energy. He was the first president to really take on energy as a critical issue, and he did so early on in the, the famous speech that we'll talk more about in June of 71. Uh, he also did a number of things on the environmental side, and Jim Schlesinger was saying to me earlier, he was the first environmental president, created EPA, passage of the, what's now known as NEPA, National Energy and Environment Policy Act, uh, extensions of Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, all played into this picture of energy. Uh, he proposed a number of things in his first energy speech, many of which we continue to talk about today. Uh, energy efficiency, R, more energy R&D, uh, renewables, clean coal, uh, the creation of a department that would consolidate energy under a Department of Natural Resources. All of those things were in that first speech. And domestically, uh, the situation here was one in which the United States was a, one of the largest oil producers in the world in, uh, at that time. But that was soon to change as the uh, first chart shows what happened with the U.S. oil production. It reached its highest level in 1970 and has gone down more or less steadily for almost 40 years. We're now seeing, just now, after 40 years, seeing a little bit of a, a tick back. But the main thing to point out here is U.S. domestic industry w was at its uh, highest level of production in 70. Uh, demand was rising in a controlled price environment, pressing up against limited supplies, and our imports were increasing, which caused uh, concern even as far back as the Eisenhower administration when the mandatory oil import program uh, limited the amount of oil imports. Oil prices were relatively stable. And the next chart shows that the uh, uh, price of gasoline, the mid 35, 36 cents for most of the, uh, of the first few years until uh, the uh, embargo induced increase in prices. So these are the kinds of uh, things that were happening in the domestic energy in, uh, in period 1969, 70, 71, leading up to the, uh, the embargo. And as today, then as now, we had regional politics playing an important role with the producer states, of course, pushing for uh, protection from rising Middle Eastern oil imports and had a couple of good politicians by the name of Sam Rayburn and Lyndon Johnson very much lobbying for that in the 60s and uh, they were successful. Uh, we also had Northeastern congressmen from mostly consuming states saying we need to control prices and indeed, in uh, the early, middle part of 1971, uh, wage and price controls were imposed to deal with broader inflation, but also uh, to deal with energy prices. On the international scene, the Arab-Israeli and Palestinian issue continued to fester all the way back, could even go back to the Suez Canal crisis, 56, 57. But there was a 1967 war in which uh, Israel completely dominated the uh, 
Arab forces, and it was somewhat of a, uh, uh, I think it stuck in the, in the craw of the leaders then, and it certainly was, played a role in what was to become the era, Yom Kippur War of 1973. OPEC was beginning to sh uh, show increased power to set prices, uh, and, and, and it uh, manifested by a couple of agreements. One called the Tripoli Agreement, followed by a, a, and a Tehran Agreement. Those were in 70, 71, and the, the key price hawks were the Shah of Iran and a young colonel by the name of Gaddafi, who uh, was, was part of that, that story back in 1970-71. U.S. Re maintained very close relations with Shah, of course, and with King Faisal in Saudi Arabia. But there was no mechanism for consuming countries uh, so that uh, these energy issues continued to mount, and the uh, president uh, continued to call for legislation from Congress to deal with uh, energy prices, energy production, and uh, all the way from that period after his first speech in 71, all the way up to uh, just before the embargo. He had speeches in April of 73, in the middle part of 1973, again imploring Congress to pass legislation uh, to create a new department to uh, increase funding for R&D, and, and in the summer of 73, he announced the appointment. Being frustrated by Congress in action, he announced administratively the creation of an energy policy office and appointed former Governor John Love to head up that office. He was the first sort of so-called energy czar. Also brought in a special consultant by the name of Charles de Bona at that same time. And the prominent was also a prominent role given to uh, then uh, Treasury official William Simon, who directed the Oil Policy Committee. All of this was happening just prior to the Yom Kippur War of uh, 6 October 1973. And is the Arab leaders were particularly unhappy with the United States because of our support of Israel and the uh, continued support uh, when it looked like Israel might even lose that war. That led to the imposition of an oil embargo by the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, OAPEC, in, on the 20th of October. Then the president made what is now called the Project Independence Speech in November of 1973, calling on the United States to mobilize and to make sacrifices to reduce consumption uh, to deal with this uh, embargo and subsequent oil production cutback. Uh, he, he, he listed a number of specific things, which I'm not going to go into because I think uh, some of our panelists today will. Uh, but it was basically an administrative response to this crisis. He created more formally the Federal Energy Office at that time uh, and requested Congress to formally uh, uh, set up a Federal Energy Administration. This was in November of 1973. At that time, he uh, appointed uh, William Simon, Bill Simon, to head up the Energy Emergency Response of, uh, Coordinating Committee in the White House. And uh, his deputy at that time was uh, John Sawhill, later to become the head of FEA. Both uh, governors, Governor Love and, and Mr. DeBona submitted their resignations at this time, obviously signaling some in, uh, disarray within that uh, policy-making group. Uh, internationally, the president invited fellow heads of state from consuming countries, the major consuming countries at that time, of course being mainly Euro Europe and Japan, to send their foreign ministers to Washington to a Washington Energy Conference in February of 1974, which was uh, chaired by Henry Kissinger and was to uh, lead to the uh, formation of the, what we now know as the International Energy Agency. 
Uh, there were a number of actions that were taken administratively, but Congress never did really pass a comprehensive energy bill or even a bill to respond to the crisis that was had, it, had any meaningful uh, components to it. Uh, now, the, uh, after the at Washington Energy Conference of uh, February 1974, uh, Congress finally did move and create the Federal Energy Administration. Its first administrator was John Sawhill. Uh, and it turned to deal with some of the skepticism that existed among the public and even in Congress about the how real this crisis really was. Many said, oh, companies were just withholding the oil to get the price to rise. Windfall profits tax was proposed but never passed. Uh, President asked the then FEO to audit oil companies to uh, look into allegations of price, price gouging. That may sound familiar. So what, let me conclude by saying, I think that the President deserves a lot of, President Nixon deserves a lot of credit for taking on this issue at a time when there was not a lot of public support or even understanding of the energy scene majority of Americans at that time were not even aware that the U.S. imported any oil, so they were shocked to find out we were embargoed and that made a difference. Uh, obviously, the allocation of oil through the voluntary allocation program that later became mandatory, which Jim Tozzi is very familiar with, uh, was part of the reason we had the long lines in 1973-74, and that clearly was an unpleasant uh, environment for politicians who then had to ask constituents to make sacrifices. And again, uh, the president didn't get much, as much support as uh, I think uh, he deserved for doing that. So with that kind of overview, uh, I think it's also Interesting to note that e even in recent speeches, as recently as uh, 09, Pre President Obama mentioned that President Nixon was the first president to take this on and use that, of course, to say, here we are 40 years later with many of these same issues. And uh, only a couple weeks ago, Governor Perry and uh, his campaign talked about self sufficiency. And the Project Independence report that uh, President's Project Independence speech of November of 73 led to this tome that the Federal Energy Agency produced about a year later. Uh, and here today we have uh, three very distinguished panelists to uh, discuss their perspectives, all very different roles, but insightful parts of the Nixon Energy and national security uh, response to the scene that I've just set. We're gonna start off with Ambassador Richard Fairbanks who served that specifically during his time as the White, in the White House as a senior pol domestic policy advisor on energy, environment, and natural resources. Uh, he'll be followed by uh, James Tozzi who served as a senior manager for, uh, as a, in chief of the environment uh, Bureau in the Office of Management and Budget, and especially uh, knowledgeable about the regulatory issues that uh, came up during, these, uh, during this time. And finally, Dr. James R. Schlesinger, Sr., uh, served three roles during the Nixon administration. First, as we saw, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission then became director of Central Intelligence and uh, was named Secretary of Defense in 1973 and dealt with the energy issues from a national security perspective. So start with uh, Ambassador Fairbanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. Uh, for those who are literally inclined, you may remember the quotation, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That was written, for those of you who don't remember, uh, about uh, two cities, called A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, uh, 
What you may not know is the two cities were Washington and Riyadh. <laughs> That's what I remember anyway. But um, we're going to talk about three things today, my fellow uh, panel members and I. And they are three things that were thrust upon <clears throat> President Nixon and his administration uh, by, first of all, uh, his being a little ahead of his time and seeing the issue, as you heard, gave the first energy speech by any president in 1971, and then by the exigencies uh, of what happened with the war and its aftermath in 1973 uh, with its domestic and international implications. And so the president and his administration had to deal with three sets of problems. They had to deal with, starting from ground zero, uh, policy and uh, the personnel, and institutions. And so as you'll hear in the course of these remarks, all three of those uh, took a lot of the President's time and attention, so much so that in 1974, in his uh, State of the Union speech, his final State of the Union speech, he said the number one problem facing this country is energy. So we came a long way. Well, as you heard, and as you saw in the original opening uh, film clip there, the President's chief domestic policy advisor uh, was John Ehrlichman, a lawyer from Seattle, Washington. And uh, do we have a picture of Ehrlichman? I can't tell from up there. There, there's John. And uh, John Ehrlichman uh, was a very fascinating person. After he went through the debacle of uh, Watergate and what happened to him and going to jail and all those things, uh, he ended up writing novels and working for a little company called Law Engineering down in Atlanta. And uh, my first brush with John Ehrlichman was when I got shanghai over from the brand new Environmental Protection Agency uh, to join the domestic policy staff working for John Ehrlichman. And after about a year of that, in uh, 1972, right after the election, during the election, of course, uh, all the bureaucrats like me were asked to put in our resignations, and then if they weren't picked up, to say what we'd like to do if we stayed. And so I put in mine, and I said what I'd like to do is to move over to the Department of Defense and hopefully become Deputy Secretary of the Navy. Being a former naval officer, I thought that would be kind of neat. And my boss, John Whitaker, said he'd be happy to stay in the administration, but only if he got to stay in his current role as a White House staffer. And of course, government being government, John Whitaker was shipped out to the Interior Department, and I stayed in the White House and took his job. And so uh, John Ehrlichman, right after the 1972 election, called me into his office, and he says, this energy stuff I think it requires a little more attention we've been giving to it because we didn't have anybody specifically worrying about it, domestic policy staff. He says, take a look at it and tell me what you think. And so I went off for a few days and I came back and I said, darn right, John, this is important stuff and it's so important that I, I think we need more than 10% of my time. And he said, well, you can go hire a couple of people. I said, geez, that's the first time anybody ever told me I could hire somebody. So I went over to uh, State Department, hired one fellow who was supposed to be expert on the international side and one to the Interior Department and took a young, obscure a PhD from the Interior Department to focus on the domestic side. And the international side uh, was a fellow named Jim Akins, oh, he's going to come up over there, uh, who subsequently became U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia. And on the domestic side, I don't know if you ever heard of him because he was lost in the mists of history, uh, he set up a company called Enron, his name was Ken Lay. So we all have roots and we all have histories, there are theirs. Now, you heard uh, from Brother Caruso here uh, that the first office that was de uh, designated to uh, worry about energy, other than us little staffers, uh, was uh, headed by Governor Love, the former governor of Colorado. And uh, he had Charles DeBona, subsequently the head of the American Petroleum Institute, as his chief of staff. And uh, Governor Love uh, and Charlie lasted for about the first six months of that focused energy side. And it was an important and a very fast moving six months. One of the key pieces of legislation, you heard that the President submitted a lot of pieces of legislation, we'll hear more about that as time goes forth, but one of the key pieces of legislation was the first one that Congress actually passed uh, at the President's request that actually made a difference, and that was the legislation to build the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline. Uh, that was a very contentious issue. Uh, the President's request for legislation came up right in the middle uh, of the national 
obscure about the Arab oil embargo, and it was a very hot time politically because, of course, uh, environment was, was uh, riding high. Uh, people's attention was focused because of the energy question on increasing domestic energy supply, and the two were seen to collide uh, in this particular piece of legislation. I remember sitting in Senator Ted Stevens' office. Senator Ted Stevens, of course, was from the state of Alaska and a big supporter, uh, therefore, of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And that day, the New York Times had a little cartoon on the front page. And the cartoon was a small picture of the state of Alaska. And they had this big black line uh, running down the middle of the uh, cartoon. And it says, this is the proposed Alaska Pipeline. And Senator Stevens, of course, was outraged because he said, no, wait a second. If the state of Alaska were the same size as an 18-hole golf course, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline would be like running a thread across the golf course, not like this big black line. And so he thought they were waiting the uh, public opinion against him. So we go into battle, and Ted Stevens proposes a one-sentence piece of legislation, which I, as a young lawyer, I think drafted. And it basically said, enough of these environmental impact statements. We've done enough of them. No more judicial review. Uh, what's, what's done now is sufficient. And the Congress, therefore, says, let's move forward and build the darn thing. So it comes up to the vote in the Senate, and the vote was 49 to 49. And so the first and only time in his uh, long and distinguished career as Vice President of the United States, Spiro T. Agnew cast his one vote to break the tie on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Little known facts. Now, finally, as we move forward, I will turn this over to my friends and colleagues here. Um, as you heard again from Guy, the first uh, actual office, formal office established by executive order by the president was the Federal Energy Office. People said, why'd you call it the Federal Energy Office? Office of Energy Policy would be pretty snappy. And I remember sitting in Mel Laird's office. Mel was then a senior counselor, the senior counselor to the president, having been Secretary of Defense. And uh, Mel says, yeah, Office of Energy Policy sounds good. I said, wait a second. We have just uh, ended last week uh, the career of the Office of Emergency Preparedness, OEP, and all the bureaucrats throughout Washington will be terribly confused if the next week we come up with a new OEP. This will never work. He said, what should we call it? I said, Federal Energy Office. So that's what it became. That was headed initially, as you heard, uh, formally by Deputy Secretary of Treasury Simon and uh, staffed by John uh, Sawhill, who had been from the Office of Management and Budget, and they took up the reins of dealing with this issue full time, of which we will hear more because there were three presidential speeches in 1973. Uh, there were uh, a number more in 1974, and concluding with uh, the veto of some legislation that finally got through the Congress, uh, supposedly addressing uh, the energy question, which the president didn't like. So there's a lot more to this story. I hope I've whetted your appetite, and I'll be happy to turn it over to Jim Tozzi. Thank you. I guess I'm wired. Um, I'm to speak on the regulatory aspects as well. My good friend Jim and Richard were making policy. My colleagues and I in OMB, uh, policy doesn't mean anything if it doesn't get into uh, uh, regulations that run the private sector and, uh, and the public sector. So we're on the receiving end of this, and I'll give you some of my discussions. Prior to that, I'd like to make one other point. Uh, as an, I'm going to describe the President's regulatory program on energy, but there's a, a point I need, I need to make is that up to, to, to the time that President Nixon came aboard, the only two people that really had anything to do with regulating the regulators were the courts and the Congress. And the President Nixon uh, established a process called the Quality of Life Review that really was the first administrative attempt to regulate the regulators. And up to now, he's got very little credit for that. And I refer you to the forthcoming uh, article in the Administrative Law Review, which is a, quint, a joint publication of, the, of um, American University and the ABA, where there's going to be a lot on that. And for the first time, the Nixon administration that really set the stage for regulating the regulators will get its due credit. Now, when I go into the regulatory aspects of, of, of what um, uh, of the Nixon administration did, is that I, I, I'm reminded I spoke on regulations in New Orleans uh, around a year ago, and uh, I have a number of friends that are musicians down there, and a couple of them attended my, speak, my, my speech. And they said, you know, after you speak with regulations, it's looking like 
it's like watching paint dry. So just stick with me a few minutes because uh, this stuff is somewhat detailed and not the sections. But without regs, none of the policies that my colleagues here made really works. I'm going to give you a few things that the Nixon administration did are very bold, very controversial, but they're also against a backdrop. We had an oil embargo and we're getting short of oil, so you have to transpose the events of that day into some of these regulatory actions I, I, I'm going to describe. Um, uh, I would put them in four categories. Uh, regulatory relief, conservation, uh, crude oil, uh, price control, and allocation of, of products. In terms of regulatory relief, uh, the administration really went out and wanted the OCS uh, uh, Outer Continental Shelf to be developed, and there was a lot of, a huge amount of redundancy in the regulatory structure. And I think they approached that, the administration including me, approached that and all the staff at OMB and the agencies, by the way, and cleaned those cobwebs. The other big thing that I did on regulatory relief, well before shale oil ever became a, 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 an issue, there was enough thinkers, particularly at the career level in the government, that, shale, that said shale deposits were going to be a big issue, and we have to set a precedent for a licensing and regulatory structure on shale, which was done with the approval of, of, of my colleagues to my right and left. On conservation and standards and guidance, uh, there was a huge number of proposals, more than you could ever imagine, because you thought we were, were out there drilling all the time. We weren't. There were uh, proposals for speed limits, for insulation, decorative lighting, office hours, thermostat control, daylight saving times, gas mileage, appliance labeling. A lot of them were enacted, some weren't, some were expired after a couple years, but there was a reasonable push uh, uh, on conservation. I don't think it's quite as much credit as it does, should. Now let's get into price regulation. Now, Anyone that's an economist has some biases, as you do. So you're going to have to put the, my bias of being an economist. Most economists are not very helpful on price regulation. And maybe during the, the discussion, our colleagues here can add to the discussion how a very conservative pro, uh, uh, president named Richard Nixon would come up with price controls. That's a story in itself. But let me tell you basically what it did. It was an uh, amazing thing because uh, around August 15th of the year, uh, all my bosses went out to Camp David, and when they came back, we had price control. So I, I don't know exactly how all that worked, but it worked. So we announced, they announced a very uh, amazing program. We said it had four phases, or not now, it, it developed into four phases. The first one was a 90-day mandatory freeze across the economy on wage and prices. It was absolutely amazing to try to implement. It had 90 days. Then after that, we went into phase two. And phase two uh, had uh, uh, the same controls, but we, we relaxed them in one way. We said anyone that is producing goods and products subject to wage and price and control, we will let your costs go through, uh, pass through your costs, with the exception of energy. We did not deregulate that portion of the energy. We went to phase three, and during that point in time, uh, there started to be a small increase in heating oil prices, which got the Congress and uh, all the politicians quite, quite concerned. We then moved to phase three, and that's where it really got heavily. First, we made it voluntary for a couple months. The increase in price of heating oil went really high. And in the entire Washington, not only President Nixon, the Congress, the consumer groups, everyone was pushing for price control. So you can't say it was just a Nixon thing. Uh, you can't imagine the number of people in Washington on both sides of the aisle that wanted this huge thing of price control. Well, we put it in, and we made really a gargantuan rule called Special Rule Number 1, which set price limitations on the, uh, the majors of the oil companies, and we really tied them down. And finally, we went to phase four, and I think we made the biggest mistake in the history of the program. Uh, that is where we limited the price of domestic crude to 425 a barrel. And I think the implications of that, that decision was absolutely astounding. So then, when we did all the price allocations, what happened? The market wasn't working. It needed Band-Aids. More than Band-Aids, it needed major surgery. And so what happened is this, the Congress passed Emergency Petroleum Allocation Act. We had a huge act that gave unfettered authority to allocate products 
And some people think it's just crude oil. We allocated the, we had the authority for, for, for products in addition to the crude on mammoth, mammoth, mammoth regulatory program. And if you look at the regs, pages and pages of details, what is and when, how do you measure the oil? I mean, it was, it was making people outside of government that left like Richard very wealthy doing all that stuff. <laughs> and so uh, now, so what was the impact of this program, of the price control and the allocation? In my opinion, it was absolute chaos. I don't think any social good that I know really came as a result of that program. Uh, I think it was a nosedive into confusing activity with accomplishment. Uh, it, I, it didn't come, and, there, and, and me and a lot of people really wrote treatises on this. It said it increased prices, created shortages, changed the economic structure of an entire industry, and increased U.S. dependence on imported oil. Not very many positives on that list. Now, with that, the end result is that uh, this, and that's why I think it's good to have uh, 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 legacy forms like this. On one hand, I think it's good because you learn from history. On the other hand, my view is Americans have a big disdain for history. I don't see very many in policy and government ever look back more than six months, Republicans or Democrats. So the idea that you're doing this may have some impact. But let me close with, with one last point. Even when we went through this episode, you would think that in the short run, people would look at, the, uh, look at the, what we learned from price control and the allocation system. And what occurred? The policymakers, and I don't mean in the administration, in the Congress and the public said, ah, price control didn't work. But you know what will work? We'll put windfall profit taxes on because if the prices go up, we'll recoup, we'll recoup the difference in that. So what happened? President Nixon recommended a windfall profit tax that didn't pass. President Ford recommended one that didn't pass. President Carter reckoned one and did pass. And if you read two federal studies on the Nixon price control, uh, uh, the conclusions of it, and I'll be finished in a second, a GAO said it, uh, the, the, the price control program of the, Nixon, of the sorry, Carter administration was passed, not, is the largest and most complex tax ever levied on U.S. history. Congressional research study did it and said the windfall profits tax depressed the domestic production and extraction industry and furthered our dependence on sources of oil. So in conclusion, I think one thing, if anyone, another generation, look at this legacy form, I would hope they would say that if you're going to intervene in the markets to make a, a, a federal mandate of, the, of, of mandating the differential price between domestic produced crude and that coming from foreign crude, you better do it very diligently because everybody that tried it before you failed. Thank you. Fellow historians, <laughs> I am reminded the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. I mean, yes, Mr. Secretary, you're right. Uh, if one looks at the Nixon speech in January of 71, it's all there. The Bible tells us there is nothing new under the sun. All of the items that have been discussed in energy policy through subsequent administrations can be found in that speech, including windfall profits tax, uh, gasification of coal, liquefaction of coal, the coal conversion program, more emphasis on R&D, subsequently the energy independence, about which we have been hearing now for 60 or 70 years, and uh, price controls, mandatory allocation, uh, energy efficiency, conservation. That is the menu that has been used by all subsequently different presidents have chosen different pieces of that menu. Now, that was not the first energy crisis that we faced. That goes back to 1956 at the time of the closing 
of the Suez Canal of, after the British-French invasion of Egypt. At that time, the crisis was minimal because the United States had so much shut-in capacity that it could tie Britain and France, all of Europe as a matter of fact, over with that uh, by opening up the unused capacity that was limited under state statutes. Uh, the 1967 war had a similar impact, but the 71 speech was the first comprehensive look at all the alternatives that we could use, good ones and bad ones, to deal with what was becoming an energy problem. The American public found it difficult to believe that the United States had a problem. And that was driven home by the 73 crisis. In 1973, I was a Secretary of Defense, sitting at my desk, looking at cables, and the top cable was one from the Exxon Corporation that stated, due to the orders of His Excellency Zaki, uh, Ahmed Zaki Yamani, we must cut off supplies of oil to the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean and to your forces in Europe. I was more astonished than angry. Congress was more angry than astonished. Subsequently passed legislation making it a criminal offense for American companies to obey the dictates of foreign countries, directed precisely against the Arab oil embargo. When I was uh, AEC chairman, I had gone to see the president and said, Mr. President, we have an organization that is devoted to pushing one energy import, nuclear power. But what the country is really interested in is energy output. And the United States ought to be working on R&D across the entire energy spectrum to find out which of the various energies was most cost-effective from the standpoint of the American citizen. We subsequently had ERDA, uh, the Energy Research and Development Organization, that moved away from the prior emphasis on nuclear power. And of course, years later, we had the accident at Three Mile Island, which moved us a great deal further away from nuclear power. That's not to say anything about Japan, tsunamis, and what the impact is on nuclear power. Amongst the things that we inherited from that period is energy independence. Energy independence at that time was a myth. And it continues to be a myth that is dangled before the American people. We are never going to have energy independence until such time as we get off the internal combustion engine and move away from uh, aircraft mobility. Because we are dependent on liquid fuels for our automotive fleet. Energy independence talked about gross energy included nuclear energy, coal, and so on. But the fact is that producing more electric power under present circumstances does not give us energy independence. That depends upon liquid fuels, and the United States does not produce and will not produce sufficient fuels to satisfy our public demand. Beating up on the oil companies doesn't really solve that problem. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you all.
Um, everyone has mentioned uh, that first speech in June of 71, uh, and there was no formal structure, as, as you pointed out, that a very small group of people, maybe even, not even a group. Not even a group. Doing energy in, uh, in June of 71. But yet, that, as Jim pointed out, it contained the menu that really hasn't changed that much in 40 years. Uh, can you get, go into a little insight into how they came up with that? I mean, who, somebody must have, uh, you know, who were the key actors in, in uh, putting that speech together? Well, I'm happy to say I was not present at that creation. Uh, I didn't arrive until the end of June. And so uh, I know it was uh, the Domestic Council and OMB were the prime movers. But you were there, Jim. What do you think? Well, I was at that time a little higher than my pay grade because I was still reviewing these boring regulations. But the yes, the OMB drafted a range of options that went through the deliberative process within OMB. And, but I don't know uh, if a director was involved, but I don't know the, exactly who played in that game. Well, on the domestic council side in the White House, um, John Ehrlichman, as I said, was head of the domestic council. But his chief person, the associate director in this area, uh, was John Whitaker, who I mentioned subsequently went to the Interior Department. And uh, uh, it was his area uh, to worry about the domestic council staff. And so he would be the one who would have carried the uh, Baton on. But Jim was there as associate director right before it started. At OMB. Yeah, at OMB. I was talking about domestic. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I know it was even back then, uh, a year before the next election, the, the 1970 72 election, we just had come out of a extremely tight presidential election between. Uh, President Nixon and the uh, challenger, uh, uh, the, the Minnesota congressman, uh, Humphrey. Humphrey, that, uh, that was 68. 68. So here we are. 72, three, it was not a tight election. Yeah. True. <laughs> but he's faced with uh, House and Senate controlled by Democrats. Mm -hmm. You have uh, rising prices of energy. Uh, this was before price controls. They were August, as Jim pointed out, August of 71. Was, uh, was did politics play? I mean, well, I'm at, you know, at least from your, your perspectives, obviously politics must have played an important role in, in this first energy speech. Uh, well, politics only plays a role uh, in, uh, I think, any area of uh, presidential involvement. Uh, that depends on oxygen. Because uh, obviously the White House, my theory of government is easy questions get handled by GS-11s, hard questions get handled by Deputy Assistant Secretaries, and harder and harder and harder. When they come up to be too hard to handle, they get kicked out up to the White House, and the White House flips a coin. And did very tough ones get up there, and they're purely political, or they would be handled by uh, people down the food chain. And so clearly, uh, the ones that the president and his staff have to deal with are the ones that are very, very difficult to deal with. And I always thought that the most important thing when it gets up to that level is not to worry so much and, and uh, uh, have an ulcer as to whether you're right or wrong, but to make the decision and move on to something else. I, I would like to comment. I, you know, I was really enthralled with the idea of price controls. And let, let me give you my understanding, a little bit of the, the history of the price control. Uh, there's an Economic Stabilization Act that was passed in 1970, and it gave all these organic authorities to the president to implement. But they never thought a Republican president was going to use it, in my mind. And so it was out there a couple of years, and all at once these shortages started to occur. And in my view, just because I didn't sit with it uh, at that time, uh, later, but not that at that time, I didn't sit around in the Roosevelt Room, but what happened was, my understanding was, uh, was Governor um, John, John Conley was very interested in the idea uh, right before the election that prices were increasing, there was no control, and he, he went, and he, I think it's John was Secretary then, uh, uh, Treasury, yeah. And he, he, I think his view was, at least my understanding of his view was, 
you know, we got to show some bold action and we got to control these prices. And however, the decision process went up to the president and it came out, yes. But when it came out, surprisingly, the whole town of Washington was for it. It wasn't just they didn't like it. I mean, you had consumer groups applauding uh, this intrusion of the, I mean, and you had members of Congress. And a couple times, you did get letters into OMB saying we're not controlling the prices or the, the, the cost of the living costs. So I think uh, the, the introduction of price controls was, all that was done under President Nixon, I think it was a, a more of a societal thing. They, people really liked it, and that's why we implemented it. But the other thing at that time that everybody was clamoring for, uh, governors, uh, mayors, various members of Congress of both parties, even some within the administration, as we got into the crunch uh, of the so-called oil, uh, Arab oil embargo, uh, was to have a program uh, of rationing, formal rationing. And the president, President Nixon, had been involved with the OPA uh, in a prior, prior life, and he thought that rationing was the end of the world's stupidity. And so he stood up against it, uh, even though uh, across the board and across the political spectrum of the United States, people were in favor of it. So there was one where he, he did yeah. not go the way the river was flowing, uh, although uh, we found, I didn't even know it at the time, subsequently found out that actually uh, uh, we had rationing coupons printed, uh, but of course we went to the rationing by standing in line and the rationing by don't uh, buy uh, gasoline on weekends uh, and pleading with people to drive more slowly and things like that. Uh, no, but happily, we didn't go to the 50 miles per hour. 50 miles per hour, yes, indeed. The trucker's delight. But on that, on that allocation, there was a story that would go around, we'd come out of meetings that uh, President Nixon had worked in the, uh, one of the OPA, whatever it was, and he saw firsthand something about the Curtis Candy Company, where they made candy bars and they were, alloc they were putting price controls during the war. And what the Curtis Candy Company did, they kept the price of it, made the candy bars smaller. And they said that the president had this bad taste about this allocation. And Richard's quite right. He was never overly for it, but he signed it, signed a bill, came out of the Congress. In, in essence, I'm pretty sure if he didn't sign it, it would have been overturned. There was this clamoring because they said the heating oil was going up, was, these, these shortages were coming back. And for some reason, the entire town of D.C. thought a bunch of people in a couple of offices in 17th Street and around could allocate all of these goods and services without any, I mean, it was amazing. Uh, and it failed. The damned oil companies <laughs> were told, stop producing that much gasoline, switch over to heating oil. So right. the U.S. government could decide on the allocation within refineries. The price controls were not as bad as mandatory allocation. That was really uh, stupid, and it continued to be a problem all the way through because allocation becomes purely a political matter. Whoever has the most clout gets more allocation. Uh, in those days, it was the truckers that uh, came into demanding results. They also came in uh, during the uh, fall of the Shah, they were still around and demanding uh, special allocations for truckers. Uh, at that time, uh, we had urged the White House, by all means, stay away from allocation. Don't give in. And we had this young woman who represented the White House in meeting with the truckers. And she had instructions, no allocation. At the end of it, we got the word, start allocating fuel. Why? You were told not to do it. Answer. She was about five foot two. She said, you've never sit, sat in the room with these people who are six foot six with necks that are as thick as a, as a tree threatening you, so you just go along with them. And that's the way we got into allocation in la at a later period. So the question is, is it worse to be a sexist or a sizist? <laughs> well, I'll just go back to boring regs. Uh, what he said is... Uh, let, let me finish up on the price controls. A freeze is not so bad if it's temporary. 
but circumstances change. And what happened was that the freeze was imposed when oil prices in the Middle East were $2 a barrel. Pretty soon, as a result of the 73 war, oil prices worldwide were $13 a barrel, and we were trying to hold prices down. Well, this created an enormous temptation for the industry later on to distinguish between old oil and new oil. And if you could move from the category of old oil to new oil, you made a lot of money. Uh, but it was the price gap that was the real problem. And an immediate freeze, if you take it off quickly enough, uh, is tolerable. Less than ideal, but tolerable. And that was also true, I think, of natural gas, wasn't it? We have old gas and new gas, or different categories. Categories. Natural gas was a problem of the Supreme Court of the United States in the Phillips decision. But I remember uh, uh, you were talking about allocation. Allocation was not just to truckers. You remember allocation was also regional. And of course, the people in the Northeast said, wait a second, those guys down there in Texas, Louisiana, where the Bruce's stuff, they were drowning in it. They got plenty of supply. It doesn't cost them much. We're up here freezing in the dark in New England. And I remember uh, President Nixon brought a wide ranging congressional group in. And uh, he was trying to convince them uh, that the way to go was to deregulate prices, which would raise domestic supply over time and both get uh, allocated better and more efficiently and increase our domestic supply and diversify our supply. And we have this long presentation. And sitting to the president's right uh, was the senior member of the House of Representatives, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, one Tip O'Neill. And Tip O'Neill, the president turns to him and he says, Tip, what would you think of that presentation? Speaker says, Mr. President, that was a very persuasive argument you've just made, and I think intellectually I might even be convinced by it, but as you pointed out, it'll take 10 years for these policies to be felt, and I've got five elections between now and then. Yeah, but uh, I was going to say, on the labyrinth of the regs, they were so complex and so big that the policymakers on one of this would say, we're going to reduce the prices and get, get out of price control. But under the, under the bushes, we'd have a, a bunch of regs like special order number one that controlled the prices of all the majors. And so, as he said, uh, there's a differential between the two prices of domestic and foreign oil. And what happened was, is that when we did that, the, for, uh, the domestic oil guy said, I'm not making any money out of doing the domestic stuff. I will start trying to get it, selling it in the other markets. And what happened was, Sun it was Sunoco came in and said, I can't play this game because I can't play these prices to compete in these markets. And so what they did, they said, we can't play in the markets. We, we're not going to play this game. We're not. So it, it, every time you fixed one portion of the regs, there was some, something other than these thousands of regs that bit you. It, was, it, was it wasn't the northerners who said, we're freezing in the dark. It was the southerners who put stickers on saying, let the damn Yankees freeze in the dark. Uh, it was a renewal of the Civil War. Jim, Tosi, you, you, you mentioned the, about the complications, and Jim Schlesinger talked about how difficult it was to allocate and ultimately becomes a political decision. But where, what was the source? Somewhere there must have been a source of data by which you based these allocations. Oh, yeah. It wasn't an, an EIA then, so. No, well, what, what happened is that we had, by that time, uh, uh, FEMA, okay, uh, not FEMA, uh, yeah, Federal Energy uh, Administration. And they had, they had, they had interpreted, no, they inherited the organic statutes of the Economic Stabilization Act. We then abolished the price control program, but we didn't abolish it all because the Emergency Petroleum Act had absolutely huge authorities on price control allocation. They did it. Then what happened was, uh, I forget. Oh yeah, what came out after President Ford left, President President uh, Carter, we began to decontrol and get rid of all the stuff administratively. And then, as I recall, when President yeah, I was involved, when President Reagan came in, we issued the final thing that killed, uh, stabbed that snake. But I mean, it was. It was, it was, now, when you say uh, uh, political, I think the career people that were doing this didn't think it was political. Uh, 
although we might got help every once in a while upstairs, but by and large, I don't think they thought it was political. They were looking at a, a mass amount of data that didn't, I mean, and, and, and so was there some value judgment in it? Yes. Whether we, I think that whole allocation program was done as, as political, I think there's some big groups who come in and give you words, but the problem is you had all these conflicting needs for a limited amount of resources, and the staff did it. And what we set up was an unbelievable thing called the exceptions process, a series of regs. And boy, if there's anything great for the lobbying thing in Washington, it was the exceptions process, because it set up this, and if you thought you were aggrieved, you could petition the government for one of these reliefs. And people would be running in, not us, into the, into the urban incumbent. So uh, I think there's a lot of people that worked on it didn't think it was all that political, but it was very value laden, yes. Well, there are two parts of allocation. One was based on historical receipts. Right. And each state was uh, had an allocation based Base. upon its historic, historical usage. Then there were the special interest groups who came in, starting with the hospitals. We need fuel for our ambulances. And then it worked down through the truckers, and every special interest group had a shot at an exception. Uh, the consequence of all of this was that you had allocated on a regional basis, on a state basis, based upon past usage. And of course, the nature of an energy crisis is the demand and supply shift. So you were imposing an allocation system that was based frequently on totally irrelevant things. Uh, those rural states had large allocations. Uh, urban states or semi-urban states had small allocations. They all came in and demanded more. Keep the government out of the allocation business. Oh, it was cemented because there was a call, something called a supplier purchase rule where we had to maintain, as, as the Secretary said, all the relationships as a certain day. I think it was 1973. There's a little problem. How do you know what those relationships were in the volumes of every possible supplier that buys? All, I mean, you're talking about a huge database, and people had to work through there and caught up. And, and put a database together of how much certain people had, it was unbelievable. And how did we know when they were sending the data and the reporting numbers were right? If I can go back to one thing that Jim Schlesinger said a minute ago uh, on Project Independence. The president came out for something we call, he called Project Independence. Everybody subsequently, every president subsequently has had the same mantra, and Jim is exactly right, the chances of uh, producing it in the way it is understood are effectively zero. But uh, how did President Nixon come up with it? Well, if you read his speech and if you read his memoirs afterward, he said the country needs something to energize it, something to hold up to, something to go after, and so he used two analogies. He said we can make this like Project Apollo, we can make this like uh, the uh, creation of the atomic bomb uh, in the Manhattan Initiative, and so these will capture the American attention and give us something to shoot for, and we'll do it in 10 years, just like Jack Kennedy said, we'll go to the moon in 10 years. And so uh, uh, us silly little uh, fellows doing drafts of this energy speech would do drafts of it, and we'd send it across West Executive Avenue from the old executive office building where we were working over into the West Wing, and it would uh, disappear into the labyrinth of the West Wing. And it kept coming back after we had edited out this crazy thought of Project Independence with it popping back in there. And after about three times that that happened, I called uh, uh, the chief of staff over there, and I said, uh, what in the world is happening? Who is putting in uh, this, this strange phrase, Project Independence? And he said, this is Haldeman. Haldeman says, it's the old man. And I said, well, they elected him. They didn't elect us, so we put it in there. And then the staff had to come out and do fact sheets on all these presidential statements, down to the smallest little detail of all these things you've been hearing uh, from uh, the two gyms to my left. And uh, thank God I had hired uh, the smartest person at OMB, with all due uh, deference to my friend Tozy, to be my fact man. And he would sit there until 2 o'clock in the morning, wrestle all the other bureaucracies to the ground, and then finally he would go home like a dog with his bone in his teeth saying, we did it, boss. <laughs> 
And that was a guy, I don't know what ever happened to him, lost in the mists of obscurity. His name is Jim, Sh I mean, <laughs> Schlady. And uh, he is sitting right back here. That's why I'm being particularly funny about it. And I remember Glenn Schlady having to write the fact sheet on the energy speech. And I said, what are you going to write about how we're doing uh, project independence? He says, I don't know. <laughs> and so even though that was the headline, that was what everybody remembers from the speech, that's what the president wanted to hold up there as the torch. Nobody knew how to do it substantively. Those on the inside, those on the outside. And as a matter of fact, as Secretary Schlesinger says, there wasn't any way to do it. It was a If you want to look at the numbers, in 1974, when the speech was first made, we were importing 3 million barrels of oil a day. The goal was to have self-sufficiency by 1980. By the year 1980, we were importing 6 million barrels of oil a day, which was not a total success in achieving energy independence. There was, there was another very controversial uh, al allocation in a way. It was basically a, a trade uh, restrictions, the mandatory oil import program, which had been instituted in 1959 by President Eisenhower, at the time, responding to concern over imports. That survived up until it was lifted by the President, President Nixon in 1973. But there was a, a commission, Schultz, uh, Schultz Commission, Schultz Commission uh, appointed by President Nixon. I think it was probably 70 or 71. And, and as a good Chicago economist, the Secretary Schultz conclusion was that we should lift this because it unnecessarily protects our domestic industry and inhibits free trade. Uh, the memoirs and, uh, and books say the president was in favor of accepting Secretary Schultz's recommendation, but yet he chose not to. What Was that just politics or? I was on the uh, I was the observer for the whole Bureau of the Budget on that committee. And uh, you had Schultz on the one hand, and this professor from the Harvard Law School who was... John Dunlop, I think? No, he was uh, later on in labor. Uh, both of them pushing for freeing up imports, which it was getting ridiculous because the Saudis could produce oil at 50 cents a barrel, and we were producing oil in this country at $8 a barrel or some such number as that in order to draw in additional investment. Uh, and uh, also on the committee was Wally Hickel, governor of Alaska, who had all of his oil up there on the Arctic Ocean, which was not entirely accessible. And he wanted protection for his state. Uh, he was not in favor of letting his state be ruined by a bunch of damn Middle Easterners. So the fight raged within the committee. And as usual in such a committee, the chairman won. But obviously, because price controls continued, as Jim Tozzi pointed out, this internal inconsistency where you're keeping out the uh, less expensive oil, producing more expensive oil, and, and yet we were subsidizing. We were subsidizing well, yeah, imports. Well, yes. What we did, oh, yeah, we did that exactly. But over time, those quotas start to change for for reasons. We, we, we exceptions. Start, yeah, there were there were exceptions that didn't go to the bosses a lot, and there was just a way the government. You know, when it get, things really get bad, the government can fix things one way to make the trains run. And the career staff made some of that run, whether it was completely a lot of policy or not. But oil started to come in because there was the exceptions process, and there's not a lot written of who initiates the, the request. Subsidizing. It was subsidizing. We were using American oil producers by holding down their prices to subsidize imported oil from the people who had imposed the quota on us. That's the way governments work, by the way. <laughs> well, maybe now we can 
turn to the uh, Yom Kippur War and ultimately, a couple weeks later, the imposition of the WAPEC embargo. Um, there already were some signals to this that uh, there were concerns about our pro-Israeli policy. King Faisal, King Faisal had Faisal written us a letter back there in about March of uh, 73 in which he said, the situation in the Middle East is intolerable. Something is going to happen unless you take action. So as usual, we just regarded this as bombast. And it turned out that it wasn't bombast. Uh, the Yom Kippur War came along. Uh, we, the intelligence community, was split on this. NSA had it right, the National Security Agency. It said, something is going to happen out there. We see all of this movement. Whereas uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, if, if I may remind you, uh, said quite clearly, nothing is going to happen. It's all, it's all noise. It turned out it wasn't noise. So when war came, the Israelis who had assured us they wouldn't dare attack, an underestimation, uh, they were attacked. And they were under real pressure uh, for a while. They were concerned that they would run out of munitions because they had only stocked munitions based on the day of supply from the 1967 war, which went a lot more favorably than the 73 war. So at that point, we had to start shipping to Israel munitions. Then subsequently, the president asked the Congress to grant additional funds to Israel so that they could pay for this stuff. And at that point, uh, the Arabs imposed the embargo. So we weren't really, uh, were we already having bilateral talks with uh, the uh, Saudis and we were, <laughs> at that time? We were having bilateral talks with our friends and our opponents. Our friends, of course, with the Shah, who took advantage of the situation to shove up the price of oil while the Saudis were trying to control it, they being our opponents. Uh, one of those great ironies of history. Uh, and the Saudis worked fairly hard to end the embargo early in 1974. Uh, I think that uh, one great lesson of the embargo is that it's a boomerang. The oil weapon is exaggerated. Uh, it can be used temporarily, but ultimately it is a boomerang. And as a result of the embargo and the actions taken by consumer nations, the amount of oil shipped by OPEC gradually diminished, and since uh, Saudi Arabia was underwriting the holding up the price of oil, its share of the market fell to about a million barrels a day in the mid-1980s, at which point they said the hell with our role as price controller, we are going to start producing, and then the price of oil plummeted. One of the other uh, initiatives um, of President Nixon during this period, of course, uh, was to use this moment uh, of angst among the consuming nations uh, to set up what has turned into the International Energy Agency. And uh, he designated uh, Secretary Kissinger uh, to uh, convoke a meeting of the major, major oil consuming countries, uh, both to share data and to come together with joint policies uh, so that we would have uh, something on the other side from OPEC. And uh, although it wasn't wildly important or successful ab initio, uh, over time it has proved to be uh, something that people still think is worthwhile and we still pay a lot of attention to. 
Yeah. yeah it, it was intended as a counterpoint to OPEC exactly. initially. Ultimately, it became an arrangement for cooperative discussion so that both the consuming countries and the producing countries could at least understand what they were trying to achieve. And what the statistics were internationally on which to base uh, uh, their policies and programs. If you could believe the lying statistics. Well, we've already, and Dick's already gone into a little bit of uh, discussion about, about that uh, Project Independence speech, if we could call it that, which is the, uh, was the speech that the president gave in response to the embargo in an attempt to mobilize the uh, American public. And we do have a, uh, a clip of that, of that speech that I think might provide a little, uh, even a little more flavor uh, here. The lessons November of the 7th, 1973. Of the, earlier Manhattan. the lessons of the Apollo Project and of the earlier Manhattan Project are the same lessons that are taught by the whole of American history. Whenever the American people are faced with a clear goal and they're challenged to meet it, we can do extraordinary things. Today, the challenge is to regain the strength we had earlier in this century, the strength of self-sufficiency. Our ability to meet our own energy needs is directly limited to our continued ability to act decisively and independently at home and abroad in the service of peace, not only for America, but for all nations in the world. I have ordered funding of this effort to achieve self-sufficiency far in excess of the funds that were expended on the Manhattan Project. But money is only one of the ingredients essential to the success of such a project. We must also have a unified commitment to that goal. We must have unified direction of the effort to accomplish it. Because of the urgent need for an organization that would provide focused leadership for this effort, I am asking the Congress to consider my proposal for an Energy Research and Development Administration, separate from any other organizational initiatives, and to enact this legislation in the present session of the Congress. Let us unite in committing the resources of this nation to a major new endeavor, an endeavor that in this bicentennial era we can appropriately call Project Independence. Let us set as our national goal, in the spirit of Apollo, with the determination of the Manhattan Project, that by the end of this decade, we will have developed the potential to meet our own energy needs without depending on any foreign, enemy, eh, eh, foreign energy sources. Let us pledge that by 1980, under Project Independence, we shall be able to meet America's energy needs from America's own energy resources. One thing, I don't know if anyone was noticing, but there, I, you could see actually on the written, as, as the president reached the end of that speech, there were a lot of handwritten notes on that. And what, what wasn't on that tape is he concluded by saying, now there has been a lot of talk in the media about the Watergate issue. And I, uh, I just want to inform you, uh, make the announcement that I have no intention to resign. Now that was November 7th, 1973. But it was in the midst of a crisis and obviously there was a long way to go with respect to implementing the proposal he makes in that, proposals he makes in that speech. Just uh, maybe to at least wrap up that part of this, how big a role or how much of a, uh, a political obstacle was the Watergate issue in dealing with the immediacy of this uh, energy crisis for in your different, all three of your positions? I mean, what did, was, was that a big obstacle well, to passing the legislation? Oh, I, I think it clearly was an obstacle to passing the legislation. The Congress was out of sort, as we've already said. Both houses were in control of a different party of Congress. And the president's uh, bully pulpit uh, was muted because he had to talk in a major speech again about he wasn't going to resign. Uh, but as far as the people working on it, I mean, we didn't get to the office every day and say, geez, we've got to worry about Watergate, because we were worrying about, as you can tell, a very broad agenda uh, of things, as we said earlier, 
uh, personnel and policy and institutions uh, which required our full-time efforts. Now, that doesn't mean that the fellows uh, who we were reporting to across West Executive, uh, Ehrlichman's and Haldeman's and the President himself and things like that, as we know from the tapes, uh, they were spending a large um, amount of their time and a lot of their uh, internal energies uh, fighting the fires of Watergate, but not the substantive staffers. As Jim says, the professional staff and us secondary uh, political staff people uh, kind of washed over our heads. Now, I don't think it affected us at all. Uh, in fact, as Watergate became more and more important, I was struck by the amount of gravity of big decisions that went to OMB. I mean, I was involved in things that I never thought I'd be involved in. So, but the career staff and what we were doing on us, I don't think it affected us at all. Look. The Middle Eastern War came about. Uh, the Russians threatened to move forces into the Middle East. We responded with the nuclear alert, to which there was this upcry. And at the same time, Elliot Richardson resigned. Uh, we had a subsequent. Uh, Resignation by Ruckel's house. Ruckel's house. Ruckel's house, and the consequence was there was an uproar in uh, in February, I guess it was, of seventy uh, four, November of seventy, uh, and the first demands for impeachment came at that point, and it was the cries for impeachment that did the problem, did the trouble. Uh, so indirectly, one can talk about the oil embargo in the Middle East and problems, but it was the domestic problems that really weakened President Nixon. I think that's all I have. You. I just have, do we have time for one? Yeah. One more? One more question. That was, as a final thing, kind of, what, what were the lessons learned? What do you think we did right? And maybe some things that were less effective. Uh, Dick? Well, I think uh, Jim Tozzi has put his finger on what I think the, the one negative lesson, lesson learned is don't try to run uh, a large program from the seat of power here in Washington. This is too large and diverse a country. Uh, there are too many moving parts. Nobody is smart enough uh, to be able to handle uh, micromanaging uh, something certainly as, as difficult as energy or as price controls or the American economy from a central position. And therefore, the ability of the federal government to do particular things, uh, I think we can all have a takeaway saying there are some things that are beyond the power, competence, and ability, even if we're, we thought it were the right thing to do, which I certainly don't, uh, but that one was proved to be uh, a non-starter substantively. As far as things that went right, uh, again, as Jim Schlesinger pointed out earlier, if you go back to the 71 speech and the 73 speech and you see the entire outline of what President Nixon laid out, uh, both uh, research and development, conservation, uh, substantive programs in all the areas that uh, people have talked about ever since, uh, Department of Energy and Natural Resources, IRDA, uh, all of the institutions, all of the, the substantive areas uh, were all begun to be addressed, put on the national agenda uh, very early in the game by the first president even to see the issue. And so looking over the horizon, trying to be in front of issues, trying to look at what those implications are uh, substantively and in terms of institutions and of personnel is something that, uh, that I think uh, uh, that the president was uh, rightly uh, applauded for at the time and something that we can keep trying to do as we look at today's problems. The most difficult thing about today's problems is to see the implication for tomorrow. And uh, although it's difficult to do, that's one of the most important jobs that can be done by the government. What we have learned is something that we learned in World War II, that under wartime conditions or crisis conditions, one has a need for the strategic materials that one has to import from abroad. The way to deal with that is insurance, and we created the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in that period. And the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is the most useful element 
in dealing with potential interruptions that we have uh, found. Uh, don't fiddle around with price controls. Don't f have mandatory controls. I, I guess my, I agree with my two colleagues of what we did right and wrong. My concern is I think a lot of people won't look, watch the CSIS tape out of this thing. Not that we're brilliant, we're just telling you what happened. <laughs> and I feel they'll discard it and we'll start again and we're in another mess. Right. A note of optimism. We could, we could go on. The only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. Right. <laughs> One item as we close is a matter of personal privilege. I produce these. I'm on, this is our 13th one. These are my colleagues from before. What was so different about the Nixon administration? What causes us to be able to go back and say, see what they did, see what they thought, see how important it is today? And we did this in our first forum, and, and we described the change. But it's important to bring it up again because it's, it's echoed here. There was a significant institutional change that occurred with the Nixon administration. It was the conversion from the old Bureau of the Budget to the Office of Management and Budget. To, to expect performance out of the government, not just adding the numbers. And the best of the civil service system, the elite people, were in first BOB and then OMB. And, and they were, it's career staff, but it was, it was the creme de la creme. And the other thing that was created at the same time, the same reorganization plan, uh, uh, number two of 1970, was the Domestic Council. And what, it still exists today. It's called the Domestic Policy Council. But what was done was they brought into the office of the president domestic policy and analysis as a parallel to the National Security Council. And it's the foundation of the modern presidency. It's the beginning of saying the cabinet, which used to be cabinet government, the cabinet now has input, but policy is made in the White House and the cabinet executes. So, and, and it started in the next administration. So when you trace back any subject, at welfare or education or energy, and these are issues for which there's no permanent solution, you can go back to the Nixon people who first analyzed it from a national perspective on behalf of the president rather than an individual department. And, and, and when uh, Dick, who was on the Domestic Council, uh, Jim was on OMB, and, and, and while Jim was out in the departments, he started in BOB and, and went from there to AEC. So we trained him. <laughs> See, we take credit. We take credit for Jim. This is, it has been a thrill to do. Yeah, well, I knew all your tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Have a pleasant afternoon. <laughs>